All right. So, yeah, so there's a, um, there's a funny story about attendance. I started uh, going through the attendance list recently. Did you know we had a celebrity in class last time? Somebody's laughing because they get it. So uh, what happened was I was uh, where, where we do the attendance with the code, somebody must have like uh, gotten the link and then filled it out and filled it out again. Because uh, like one day I was here and then <laughs> trust analysis was here. Last time Billy Eilish was here. <laughs> so, so I'm curious who who did that. <laughs> now, now here's the thing. Here's the thing. It, you know, I, I actually thought it was funny, and I was like, sure, whatever, that's fine. Um, but the day that whoever was doing that forgot to sign themselves in and signed in Jason Voorhees, like, sucks to be you. <laughs> I found it hilarious, so that's fine. Um, <laughs> what's that? Yeah, no, we're we're having a guest student with every lecture. Um, okay, so um, all right, so here's so let me give you some updates. So exam one is graded. The grades are posted on Teams. Now, if you had me for statics last semester, I'm gonna do the same thing in here that I did in statics. If you did not. What I uh, have been doing recently, and I found this works out pretty well, is so when I, when I grade the exams, I, I download all the exams to, uh, to a big old Excel spreadsheet, and I don't grade each student's exam. I grade problem one for everybody, then problem two for everybody. And I do that so that it ensures that I'm making consistent deductions and so on and so forth. And so what I do is I take all that data and... When I grade, I, not only do I grade, but I'll, I'll say why. Like, oh, you got four points off on this problem, and here's why. And I type it out, and it all gets spit out to a big old PDF that I will email to each one of you. So you will all get a custom PDF that says, you know, I, you know, your name, your 901, or your MUID, or what have you. And then problem one, here's what you got wrong. Problem two, and so on, so on, and so forth. Um, I got the grading done. I just haven't sent those reports out yet. I, I literally finished the grading about 20 minutes before class. So I'll do that later today. I have a meeting with the student right after this. I have statics at one. Um, so like, I'll get them out today. I, it'll be before the end of business today. But in the meantime, I went ahead and gave you your scratch calculations back. If you just showed up, I'll give them to you, you know, near uh, uh, by the end of class, but I have the rest of them here. But you'll get that today. So between your grade, the calculations, you can kind of see what you got wrong, et cetera. The class did very well. The average was like 81.7, so you all did great. Um, I posted a video on Teams. This is something I started doing uh, during the uh, 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 virtual operation last year, and I actually still think it's a good idea. It goes through all the statistics, and I have some advice for future exams. The video is only like seven minutes long, but instead of wasting time in class, you can watch that. I, I, I think it's, it's worth uh, mentioning. The only other thing I'll, I'll uh, show, and then I want to get into the lecture, is I put a post on Teams that said it's probably not a bad idea to start bringing a straight edge to class, like a ruler, a scale, something like that, because we're going to start drawing a lot of shear and moment diagrams. Now, I see a couple of you are taking notes on your iPads and whatnot, and that's probably fine. There's probably uh, features in there that can you know, do that for you, and that's probably not a big deal. But if you're um, writing by hand, we're going to be drawing a lot of figures here soon, so uh, uh, straight edges can help. Okay. Any questions? All right, let's get to it. Okay, so um, if you recall last time, last time was all about introducing you to the concept of shears and moments inside flexural structures, beams and frames. Um, and so all we were doing last time is samurai sorting or lightsabering through a member or through a beam through an element in a structure and just what's the shear and moment inside the structure at that point. That's it, okay? Um, that's great for spot checking. It's great for determining internal forces at a point, but it doesn't uh, tell you the internal shears and moments everywhere, okay? So that's what we want to try and develop, and, and, and ultimately we plot those and we call those shear and moment diagrams. We've kind of technically already used internal force diagrams in here because at the very end of a truss problem when you solve the truss and you say this member experiences 57 kips in compression and this member experiences 37 kips in tension and that's a zero force member 
I mean, really, that's just a simplified axial force diagram. It's the interior or the um, the internal axial forces in all of the truss elements and indicating not just their magnitude, but whether or not their tension or, or compression. That is a simplistic but effective axial force diagram. Now we need shear and moment diagrams. Now, um, there are a couple of ways of going about this, and we will use a few of them. Some of them will be deriving equations. Uh, some of them will be uh, 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 using the graphical approach. The graphical approach is what we're going to use most often. Um, but in order to uh, uh, develop a graphical approach, we wanted to see if we understood the relationship between shears, moments, and the loads that are, are applied. And we ultimately came up with this. This is what we did uh, at the end of the last lecture. The idea that um, if I uh, take the derivative of moment, I get shear, and if I take the derivative of shear, I get load. Okay? But What's more useful is going the other way, because we're given a structure. Here's the structure with the loads on it. So we know the loads. So if I have the loads, how do I get the shears? I integrate. Okay. And if I have the shears, how do I get the moments? I integrate. Now, we're not going to be computing calc 1 integrals of x squared uh, very often. But the relationship, the understanding, and the idea about um, uh, how these, uh, uh, you know, going from a constant to a linear to a quadratic to a cubic, that, that pattern is very useful to understand when developing a graphical approach. Um, what I want to do is, is talk a little bit about what's going on on this slide. These are sort of my conclusions for graphical ap uh, approaches of drawing um, shear and moment diagrams. And so the, the, whenever you're constructing a shear and moment, uh, a set of shear and moment diagrams for a given structure, you start by constructing the shear diagram, and then you construct the moment diagram. Okay, that makes sense from the, the calculus that we derived last time. We developed a relationship between load and shear, and a relationship between shear and moment. So let's talk about the relationship between load and shear. So I propose that between load and shear, at any given point, the slope of the shear diagram is equal to the load, right? Okay, now that, that should make sense if we're talking about, you know, derivatives and integrals, right? I mean, there are two fundamental problems in calculus, right, given some function f of x, right? The first uh, uh, problem is what is the slope of the tangent line at a given point? And we solve that problem by developing a tool called the derivative, right? And then the second fundamental problem is what is the area under that function between point A and B? And we answer that problem by developing a tool called the integral, right? And then fundamental theorem of calculus says derivative and, or antiderivatives and integrals are the same thing. So, okay. Um, so at a given point, the slope of the shear diagram is equal to the load. And between two points, the change in shear is equal to the magnitude of load between these two points. Okay? And we can make a similar comparison between shear and moment. So at a given point, the slope of the moment diagram is equal to the shear. That's really important because when we start dealing with distributed loads, the pattern that those uh, moment diagrams follow is really going to follow that point very, very closely. And then between two points, the change in moment is equal to the area of the shear diagram between these two points. Okay? Now, our derivation was initially focused on some arbitrary you know, W of X load, that, that you know, sort of wavy load that didn't really matter what the load looks like. But we can make similar conclusions with, that we made about distributed loads, about concentrated loads, concentrated moments, uh, et cetera. The patterns uh, work all the same. So we're going to start with concentrated loads. And the reason we start with concentrated loads is because it is the easiest uh, and most straightforward uh, uh, type of, of shear and moment diagram to construct. So the idea is here's a beam, just a bunch of point loads. That's all we're dealing with today. And so that's how we're going to begin to cultivate our approach. The reason why we start here is because the math is easiest from a theoretical perspective. See, if you have a beam and you got a bunch of point loads on that beam, between those point loads, there is zero load, right? Now, let's go back to calculus. If I have a function that's zero, okay, and you take the indefinite integral, what is the indefinite integral of zero? No. Zero. Oh, what did your calculus professor say? Don't you forget? There you go. Plus C, right? Wow. Wow. That is, that is, 
I care, and I'm the engineer. <laughs> no, it, it actually does matter. So I actually want to talk about that a little bit. So a lot of times in in engineering, you know, advanced engineering analyses, I mean, if you go to grad school and whatnot, you are going to be using, you know, some calculus to derive some, some given situations, right? So a common problem that uh, you deal with in grad school is like vibrations, right? Um, vibrations matters to mechanical engineers for obvious reasons, right? And it actually matters to civil engineers as well because there is one type of analysis that matters to civil engineers in the context in the context of vibrations, and that is earthquakes, right? Because that's what an earthquake is doing is it's accelerating the building, right? So if you accelerate the building, right? You know, take the integral of that, get velocity. Second, you get position, right? And so that tells you the displacement, the deflection of the building under that um, uh, acceleration. And so in order to solve for the, the full solution, you need boundary conditions. And those boundary conditions are a function of those arbitrary constants of integration. So they actually do matter. So, so for me, I'm going to say they matter. <laughs> um, yeah. Woo. Um, your your Diffie Q professor might go, yeah, that, yeah, you need those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I was about to say, maybe, maybe when you're first learning the uh, uh, the rules for the integrals, you know, the plus C, like I guess you could forget, but you do, but it's there, right? So if you have zero and you integrate that, you get a constant. Now, what happens when you integrate a constant? What's the integral of four? Four x, right? Four x, you know, plus C, right? So the idea is, okay, if I graphed four x plus C, what would it look like? It'd be a line, right? So the integral of zero is a constant function, and the integral of a constant function is a linear function. So what that means is, if here's my beam, right, and I've just got some point loads here, between the point loads, there's no load, right? So what does the shear diagram look like? It looks like a bunch of constant functions. When you graph a constant function, what's it look like? It's just a horizontal line, right? So a shear diagram, for a beam subjected to just constant loads, it's going to look like a bunch of stair steps. It's going to be constant loads. Therefore, the moment diagram is going to look like a bunch of lines. Okay? For example, here's the shear diagram, here's the moment diagram. Line, this is constant, constant, linear, linear. I know it's kind of hard here to read, but if you look here, let's take a look at this first region. This is a linear moment diagram. I propose that the slope of this line is equal to that shear, to that value, right? The slope of the moment diagram is equal to the value of the shear diagram, okay? Stuff like this is kind of important because we're going to start making some, some simple conclusions to make our lives a lot easier. Being able to do things like linear interpolation and navigate what a line looks like is really going to make your life a, a lot easier. And in in order to construct the shear diagram, we integrate, or sorry, sorry, I said that backwards. In order to construct the moment diagram, we're going to integrate the shear diagram. Do I need to break out a bunch of integrals to, integra uh, to integrate this? What is the area under this? It's just a rectangle, right? So just because the calculus relationships help us in order to develop a, a graphical approach doesn't mean we need to be breaking out you know, the integral of x squared or whatever. If I need to integrate this, it's just an area, and it's a rectangle. I think we can do b times h, right, without breaking out the calculus tables, right? Make sense? So we're going to use this approach on the problem that we did last time, okay? So let's recall a couple of things. This was a beam subjected to a series of concentrated loads, okay? We have a 20 kip load, 30 kip load, 18 kip load. Um, what we did last time was, well, okay, actually, let's, let's go back way before. So this was actually the very first reactions problem that we did, like first week of the semester, and we computed these reactions 35.8 and 32.2 uh, kips respectively. We then, last time on Wednesday, we took our samurai sword or lightsaber, and we cut a section right here, right? And it was at x equals 12 feet. And do you remember these were the values that we got? We got these values, right? It was 15.8 kips and 309.6 uh, foot kips, respectively. Everybody was okay with that? I want you to just keep these values in the back of your head because we're going to see if what we do today yields this. 
at our point in question. Now, what we're doing today is a little bit larger in scope. You know, this is the shear and moment at a particular point. And what I want is the shears and moments at every point. So what we're what we're going to be uh, plotting is a little bit, you know, bigger in scope. Everybody good? Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break out my uh, my notebook here. I've already got the problem replicated here on the notebook. Why do these highlighters keep popping up? I don't understand that. Okay. So, let me uh, let me do this. Actually, let me do. I'm gonna do something a little differently. Bear with me. I'm gonna be lazy and I'm gonna screen clip just this. And I'm going to repeat the beam right here. And I'm also going to be kind of lazy. I'm going to take this and stretch it a bit. Just so I got a little bit of room. I know that looks kind of wonky, but it's kind of easy for me to see with what we're doing here. Okay, so it's the same beam. I just stretched it a little bit to make it a little easy for me. Okay, now, one of the things I said is that it's kind of helpful to have a straight edge. You do not have to use a straight edge. You really don't. But I find it to be kind of uh, 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 necessary for me because I'm kind of sloppy. Sometimes, in fact, what I might be doing here on the screen is a little sloppy. But, um, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Okay. Now, so we're going to be drawing a shear and moment diagram. The first thing to recognize if you're doing this on your notebook paper is that I'm going to have some diagrams here and some diagrams down here. So this diagram might get kind of long, okay? So like I'm going to have one here and one here, so just be ready for that on your notes. Um, what I tend to do when I draw shear and moment diagrams, the first thing I like to do is I like to draw these like little vertical guidelines. And I might make them really light or use like a dotted line, something like that. Just helps me follow what I'm doing because, again, I've never been accused of being Rembrandt when it comes to my hand-drawn schematics. Okay, so that I have something to go off of. All right, <clears throat> now, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna draw the shear diagram, and so I'm gonna start it like right here. Um, so what I do when I draw the shear diagram is I start off, I just draw a big old horizontal line. See, already I'm messing it up. Let me scroll down a bit. That's probably good. Okay. And in the interest of ensuring that I'm not wasting time writing the, the, the word kip over and over again, what I usually put here over to the right is I just say, this is my shear diagram and the units are kips. So that I've got that uh, represented. Now, if I was a betting man, for those of you that are um, marking this uh, with pencils and whatnot, um, as you start constructing shear diagrams and moment diagrams, what we're going to do today is pretty easy. But as you start doing this, some of the diagrams are going to get kind of complicated. They're going to go up and down and up and down. And so one of the things that I find valuable is taking a second and marking what's the zero line. And the way that I do that usually is I will maybe make a little, you know, like some tick marks like that so that I know that this is zero. Now, let me say this. There's a couple of you here that are um, using like your iPads or, or what have you. That might not be all that necessary because what I'm going to do here on the screen is I drew this as my zero line with black. And I'll probably use another color to actually start drawing the shear diagram so you can kind of see, okay, the black line's the zero line, and then maybe the colors are the actual values. But if you're just using your pencil, I find that's kind of kind of helpful. Um, the other thing, if you'll notice, I'm sort of drawing them like arrows. There is a value there when we do frames, because we're going to take the shear and moment diagrams and sort of like turn them this way. And so the arrows can kind of show, OK, I went this way. Like I started here, and I went there. So OK. Now. I'm going to do my shear diagram in red, OK? Now, whenever you draw shear diagrams and moment diagrams, they should start at 0 
and they should end at zero. Okay? Why? Because the sum of the forces in the y direction is zero and the sum of moments is zero. Okay? So let's start with the shear diagram. We're going to start over here on the left at zero. So I'm going to put this right here and I'm going to say that's zero. Now, whenever you're drawing the shear diagram, what you do is you look at the load diagram and you do what it tells you to do. It's that simple. So I'm sitting here, I'm starting over here on the left and I'm looking up here at the shear at the beam and I'm seeing here this reaction. And what the beam is saying is saying, hey, Greg, go up 35.8. Okay, I'll go up 35.8. So I'm at zero. And I go up 35.8. Okay. And then I did what the beam told me to do. And then I keep going. And watch this. I'm going over, going over, going over. And I get here. And the beam looks at me and it says, hey, Greg, go down 20. Okay, I'll go down 20. Now, I'm already at 35.8. If I'm at 35.8 and I go down 20, what's that put me at? 15.8. So, 35.8, go down 20. That puts me at 15.8. Maybe about like that. Go over. No change. No change. Whoa, I get right here. What happens here? Beam says, Greg, go down 30. All right. Kind of a demanding beam, but okay. I'm at 15.8. It tells me to go down 30. If I'm at 15.8, it tells me to go down 30. Where am I at? Negative what? Negative 14.2. So I go down. Maybe about like that. And I'm at negative. 14.2. Then I don't see anything. Don't see anything. Don't see anything. Whoa! I'm at negative 14.2, and this beam is again trying to order me around, trying to boss me around. It says, Greg, go down 18 tips. Okay. All right. And since we're in a professional setting, I'd prefer Dr. Mike instead of calling me Greg, but okay. That was a joke, not a very funny one. So I'm at negative 14.2, and I go down 18. What's that put me at? Negative 32.2. So I'm at negative 32.2. Over, over, over. And this is the last thing the beam's telling me to do. I'm at negative 32.2. It tells me to go up 32.2, and where do I end? Zero. See, one of the things about structural analysis is that it has a way of self-verifying your answers. See, we started at zero and that we ended at zero. What that tells me is that these two reactions satisfy vertical force equilibrium, right? That wouldn't work if, if they didn't, right? Okay, does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? All right, that's the shear diagram, that's it. That's as simple as it gets. Okay, now, the next thing that we have to do is we have to draw the moment diagram. Before we draw the moment diagram, we need to integrate the shear diagram. Now, in order to integrate the shear diagram, we could break out some calculus, but these are a bunch of rectangles, okay? So what I'm going to do, and I'm going to break out another color here, let's use blue, um, I'm going to number these rectangles. Let's do one, two, three, four. And you don't need to number this when you're doing your homework, I'm just numbering it here so that we can kind of follow along with uh, what we're doing. Okay, all right, so let's go over here off to the side and let's see if we can determine some areas over here onto the side. So we'll say areas under V 
diagram. What is um, A1? How would you determine the area of this? 35.8 times 6. Pretty simple, right? We're keeping it simple. All right. Now, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say that's positive. It's positive because it's positive area above the axis. So we'll kind of call that positive area. So plus 35.8 times 6. Okay. And what is that? Plus 214.8. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. So that we're paying attention, what are the units for that area? Foot kips. Isn't that a moment? Hmm. Says so it's 35.8 kips times 6 feet. Interesting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to label my shear diagram, and I'll, I'll put it in parentheses, and I'll say plus 214.8. What about A2? So A2 is going to be positive 35.8. Oh, no, no, that's wrong. 15.8 times 9. And what is that? One forty-two point two. So we'll call that plus 142.2. Okay. Area three. Area three is negative because it's going down. This is this is area below the horizontal axis. So we'll say negative fourteen point two times seven. What is that? Negative ninety nine point four. Do I have a second on that? Okay. And area four is negative 32.2 times eight. Say it again. Negative 257.6. So let me label these. This is so far so good. So here we go. We got two fourteen point eight. Ooh, this marker is horrible. One forty two point two, negative ninety nine point four, negative two fifty seven point six. Somebody do me a favor. Add up those four numbers. They're zero. So if we draw our moment diagram and we start at zero, we're going to end at zero, right? By golly gosh gee, look at that. So I'll put note sum of AI is zero. Now, I will tell you that actually won't always happen. There are instances where you sum the areas and they don't equal zero. We are going to deal with said instances. And you will find that there is a very specific reason why that isn't the case. We'll get to that, but right now we're going to keep it simple. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to draw the moment diagram. So I'm going to extend my little dashed lines here. Okay. Let me make that a little lower because, again, I'm, I'm kind of sloppy here. It's one of those instances where, like, quad paper actually does help out because it's kind of graph paper. You know what I mean? All right. So let's put that about right here. So we'll say foot kips something like that. All right. 
like I said, start at zero, end at zero. We kind of already determined that that's going to be the case because when we summed our areas, we got zero. Um, but we'll go through the motions and see what we get. So we're going to start at zero and start drawing this moment diagram. Now, when you draw the moment diagram, what you're paying attention to is the area of the shear diagram. So those areas we just computed. So from here to here, from this gap right there, what is the area change? 214.8, right? So if I start at zero, this tells me to go up to 14.8. So over here, I better be at 214.8. That's what this value better be. Now the question is, what does this look like here? This is a constant, and when I integrate a constant, I get a line, right? So this moment diagram should be a line like that. Again, that's a line. I know my drawing's horrible, but that's a line. Now, let's see if you're paying attention. What is the slope of that line? 35.8 kips. The slope of this line is the value of the shear diagram. No need to do M equals Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. You can do it and you'll get 35.8, right? Change in Y is 214.8 over change in X is, what is that? Six. So what's 214 over six? 214.8 over six is 35.8. Make sense? All right. What is my change in area from here to here? 142.2. So if I'm at 214.8 and I change by 142.2, what does that put me at? Say it again. 357. So that puts me right here. And again, line. What is the slope of that line? 15.8. Now let me ask you a question. Is 15.8 a positive number? Yes, right? Okay. What do slopes of positive lines look like? They look like this, right? Negative slopes go like that. Notice how this line is steeper than this line. Well, this line has a bigger slope than this line, right? Make sense? Okay. Now, what's the change in area here? Negative 99.4. So if I'm at, what'd you say, 357? And I go down 99.4, what's that put me at? 257.6. And if I'm at 257.6 and I go down 257.6, that puts me at zero. So, like that. Like that. Now, we're not done with this problem, but that's your shear diagram and that's your moment diagram. That is your answer. Let me stop for a sec. I want to see if that makes sense. I want to see if you have any questions about that. <clears throat> Just wait. We got some cool stuff I'm going to show you here in a bit. Any questions? What's that? Well, let's just put it like this. I'll be able to do a, a, a mic case drop. I'm not drop, dropping the mic. It's kind of expensive. I want to talk about... <laughs> I did? I'm sorry. <laughs> it sounded like you were going to bring that up. Because I could still completely understand you. You just sounded like... I sounded like a robot? Yeah, it was crazy. The batteries probably Maybe it was the batteries. I don't know. I, I want to talk about this 
What did we do in this example? We said, I'm going to cut a section at x equals 12 feet, and I'm going to try and determine the internal shears and moments. So let me scroll up here a little bit. So what did we do? We cut a section right here, where this dimension was 6 feet, right? Because it's x equals 12 feet from there. Well, let's follow that down a little bit. So on the shear diagram, that puts us right there. What is the value of the shear diagram right there? I think it's that. Now, what about the moment diagram? Well, let's see. If I scroll down a little bit, the moment diagram puts me right there, right? So let's see if we can determine what that value is. Now, remind me so that I, I, I know what was the slope of that line? 15.8. Let's see something. Let's do some things. So let's determine the response at x equals 12 feet. So for the shear, by observation, The shear is 15.8 kips. Hold on. I can do better than that. Now, what about the moment? Okay, so let's see. Let me let me see if I can uh, clean this, this image up a little bit. Sorry. Oh, I'm, I scrolled too far. Let's do that about like that. Okay, so let's see. So this is, what do we got? We got 214.8, and that increases to 357, right? And we're trying to determine that, but we know the slope is 15.8 right? And then in terms of dimensions, this dimension is six feet, and how long is it from here to here? Nine feet. So maybe what we can do is we can say, all right, the moment equals, okay, so we start at 214.8, and this is just linear interpolation, right? So it is the slope times the change in x, right? What this is saying, this 15.8, is I'm rising 15.8 kips for every foot. So in 6 feet, I rise up that times 6. What is 214.8 plus that times 6? 309.6. I'm not done because I got something else to show you. It's kind of cool. I think that's kind of cool. What do you think? Yes. So is it necessary to do it the way we did yesterday? Not if you can do this. Not if you can do this. And just, but I also want to show you something else to validate all this theory. Okay. Watch this. I keep reaching for this mouse. I'm not using that mouse. Another means of computing M. Watch this. Sorry, hold on. 
So I'm going to replicate something. So what did our shear diagram look like? It went up to 35.8. Then it went down to 15.8. Right, so this is 35.8 and this is 15.8. What was this dimension? Was that, what, six feet? And we're cutting a section like right here where this is six feet, right? Okay, so help me out. What is that area? That area is 35.8 times six plus 15.8 times 6. What is that? I integrated the shear diagram at the point in question. And I got 309.6. Mike case drop. That's the time for the mic crazy job. Although the little foam insert comes out, so now I have to put the foam insert back. So it was cool, and then it wasn't. <laughs> I think this stuff's kind of cool. It all sort of self-verifies. Today, hopefully, was simple. And not only simple, but in the sense that it reinforced a lot of the static principles that we've been using this semester. What we're going to do next time uh, on Monday is we're going to say, okay, now let's take this problem and ratchet it up just a little bit. And what I mean by that is we're going to add, whoop, we're going to add distributed loads. Okay. One thing I want to mention now while it's on my mind, um, we do not need this Monday. But on Wednesday, Wednesday, put this down in your notes or whatever, it might not be the worst idea to bring a laptop on Wednesday. Because on Wednesday, we're going to look at triangular loads. And what we're going to find when we do triangular loading is that integrating the shear diagram is going to be wonky. So the easiest way to do it is to actually write a function. And so we'll plot that function in Excel. So. Wednesday, bring your laptops. That's all I have. You all have a wonderful weekend.